we know he's been developing weapons of mass destruction. UN inspectors searched high and low, visiting sites identified by the CIA. They found nothing, but Bush insisted the WMD were there. The British government has learned that Saddam Hussein recently sought significant quantities of uranium from Africa. Bush told Bob Woodward of the Washington Post around this time. I do not need to explain why I say things. I don't feel like I owe anybody any explanations. These were extraordinary times. Words took on new meanings, fulfilling George Orwell's prophecies of doublespeak in his novel 1984. First they steal the words, then they steal the meaning. Words like axis of evil, war against terror, regime change, simulated drowning, preventive war. Civilians killed were now collateral damage. CIA kidnappings were now extraordinary renditions. And that most patriotic concept, the homeland, grew into a gargantuan new federal agency as labyrinthine as the Pentagon. The French philosopher Voltaire in the 18th century observed, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. The descent into unreality was dizzy. Black Hawk Down, another popular Oscar-nominated film, appeared in late 2001, glorifying American heroism and technology in 1990s Somalia. Through technology, video games became more and more lifelike. And on television, increasingly bizarre and fanciful reality game shows prospered in the ratings. Jenna, the tribe has spoken. U.S. media beat the drums of war. MSNBC, which was owned by General Electric, canceled Phil Donahue's popular primetime show three weeks before the invasion. Officials feared that the show would provide a home for the liberal anti-war agenda. At the same time, our competitors are waving the flag at every opportunity. And wave the flag they did. CNN, Fox, NBC paraded over 75 retired generals and officers, almost all of whom were later revealed to be working directly for military contractors. Pentagon officials gave them talking points, portraying Iraq as an urgent threat. Major newspapers and magazines, including the New York Times, advanced the same message. One Bush insider told journalist Ron Suskind that Suskind represented the reality-based community. But that's not the way the world works anymore. We're an empire now, and when we act, we create our own reality. When France, Germany, and Russia, as well as most of the Security Council, refused to support the U.S. position, Bush was furious and Rumsfeld sneered. You're thinking of Europe as Germany and France. I don't. I think that's old Europe. French fries in the congressional cafeteria were renamed Freedom Fries, just as sauerkraut became Liberty Cabbage during World War I. Bush laid out his new strategy in a speech to the cadets at West Point in June 2002. We must take the battle to the enemy, disrupt his plans, and confront the worst threats before they emerge. The U.S. would act unilaterally and preemptively to overthrow any government deemed a threat to U.S. security. Cheney had declared, If there's a 1% chance that Pakistani scientists are helping Al-Qaeda build or develop a nuclear weapon, we have to treat it as a certainty in terms of uh, our response. In the world we have entered, the only path to safety is the path of action, and this nation will act. 60 countries made it onto Bush's potential hit list, with Bush calling for a moral crusade saying, that the United States must defend liberty and justice because these principles are right and true for all people everywhere. Moral truth is the same in every culture, in every time, and in every place. It was a bold statement of American exceptionalism. Bruce Bartlett, who served in both the Reagan and first Bush administrations, explained, This is why George W. Bush is so clear-eyed about Al-Qaeda and the Islamic fundamentalist enemy. 
He understands them because he's just like them. He truly believes he's on a mission from God. The whole thing about faith is to believe things for where there's no empirical evidence. I have a sense of calm knowing that the Bible's admonition, thy will be done, is life's guide. In early October 2002, Congress empowered Bush to go to war against Iraq on his own authority whenever he deemed it appropriate, using whatever means, including nuclear weapons, he felt necessary. The resolution drew a direct connection between Iraq and al-Qaeda. Among those authorizing this were Senators John Kerry and Hillary Clinton. This would cost both of them dearly in their runs for president. Not all were fooled. Escalating this war and expanding this war does nothing in terms of our national security. It puts us more at risk. Iraq was not a haven for terrorists as it is now. Again, Iraq, Saddam Hussein, and Al-Qaeda, there was no connection, and we have to dispel that notion so the American people know the truth. Millions of protesters hit the streets around the world, three million in Rome a million in London, hundreds of thousands in New York. Time magazine surveyed several hundred thousand Europeans. 84% thought the United States the greatest threat to peace. 8% thought Iraq was. Bush sent Secretary of State Colin Powell, the most respected member of his administration, before the United Nations to make a case for war. He told Powell, Maybe they'll believe you. Saddam Hussein is determined to get his hands on a nuclear bomb. Powell spoke for 75 minutes. It was a thoroughly shameful performance, promoting false intelligence that Powell later called a low point in his career. But the speech, although it fell flat overseas, had the desired impact on U.S. public opinion. Support for the war jumped from 50% to 63%. The Washington Post pronounced the evidence on WMD irrefutable. The U.S., without a Security Council resolution, was moving inexorably towards war. The truth was even darker. For Bush, Iraq was only the appetizer. After devouring Iraq, the neocons had their eyes set on the main course. Pentagon officials foresaw a five-year campaign with a total of seven targeted countries, beginning with Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and the biggest prize of all, Iran. It would be a war to remake the world, the neoconservative way. Talk of empire abounded. The New York Times Sunday Magazine cover for January 5, 2003 read, American Empire, get used to it. Bush clearly was a man with a boldness of vision. He'd always exhibited an outlaw side as a younger man. Now he would outdo his towering father by going beyond the laws of nations. The eight-year war became the debacle critics predicted. Iraqi society was rent asunder. Like Vietnam, it warped America, polarizing it even further as costs and casualties mounted on all sides. Yet remarkably, Bush won the 2004 election with a naked appeal to even more fervent patriotism. By 2008, when Bush left office with the most dismal poll rating since Harry Truman, he had not only thoroughly mismanaged two wars, as well as the federal relief efforts for New Orleans in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. But most importantly, in the eyes of the public, he mismanaged the economy of the country, which nearly collapsed in 2008 and ensured the presidency to the Democrats. His successor, Barack Hussein Obama, child of a black Kenyan father and a white Kansas mother who was raised in Indonesia and Hawaii, became at 47 president of the United States, evoking great hopes for change. His words and demeanor attested to the other side of America, constitutional, humanist, global, environmental. Obama had spoken out strongly against the Iraq war. What I do oppose is a dumb war. Financed by the internet's multitude of small contributors, stunned the heavily favored and financed Democratic Party choice, Hillary Clinton, in the primaries. He now confronted an ex-military man, conservative John McCain, in the national election. 